today's lecture is going to be very exciting. We finally get to see how we can use all of our knowledge and our hard work to start computing the fundamental group of various surfaces. So if you've noticed, if you noticed, so far, the only groups we got were isomorphic to either the trivial group or the group of integers. And you might get the impression that those are the only two possible answers. And if those were the only two possible answers, then topology would be a substantially easier subject than it really is. Those are not the only two answers. There's many other. In fact, any group can be obtained from a fund. You can always cr uh, construct a topological space that will have uh, the, the, type of, the type of group that you want. So you can always do that. In fact, I'll put that, I'm going to put that as a simplified problem for commutative groups on the homework. And it's not as difficult as it sounds. So these were the only ones because we've talked about the circle and we talked about things that were contractible. And so what happened was that if a space is contractible, we know it has a trivial fundamental group. And if a space has the same homotopy as a circle, then we knew it was the group of integers. And those were really the only two answers that we saw. But now, uh, with all of the tools and all of our knowledge, we can start discussing how to compute the fundamental group for other types of spaces that have different answers. So let's start with this example. Now, before we start the example, let's just recall the Seifert von Kampen theorem and what it says. So the theorem says that X is a space and it contains some point inside the space. And you're going to write X as a union of two open sets. U and V are open and their path connected. And furthermore, uh, P belongs to the intersection of those two open sets. And the intersection is also path connected. So this was the setup in the Seifert von Kampen theorem. OK, so then the next thing that happens is, OK, so we have this. And then you create, so we have these inclusion maps. We have u intersect v can get included in u. It can get included in v. And then these two get included in x. And then you have a very similar kind of diagram with the fundamental groups. Pi 1 of u, pi 1 of v, and this is pi 1 of x comma p. I forgot to put in the, the, the base points over here, but uh, you can put them in yourself. So this is the uh, commutative diagram of fundamental groups. And what the Seifert von Kampen theorem says is that group this is the push out. This is the push out of the diagram. So more specifically, it's the push out of this triangle. So that is the group that you have to put in here in order to complete this type of triangle together. And that would be the push out. So we're going to see how the Seifert van Kampen theorem is used and how you can calculate the fundamental group uh, for this kind of problem. So let's go to a type of space that we've mentioned before. Uh, but we but we did not find the fundamental group for it. So here's our space. So let me write this down. So this is going to be the figure eight space. And the figure eight space there's different ways you can describe it. One way you can describe it is by using this notation. This means this is called the one point union. The one point union. You take two circles and you glue them at just a single point. And so you get something like this. So you get the figure eight space. Uh, this is also related to what we call the theta space. Uh, this is what we call the theta space. So you have a circle with a line going down the middle. That's what we call the theta space. 
Um, these are not homeomorphic, but they are homotopic to each other. We actually had a question on the homework to construct an explicit homotopy between them. So the other one will have the same fundamental group. But let's just focus on the figure eight space. And I think intuitively it should be clear, it should be clear that Z cannot be the answer. The group of integers cannot be the answer. Why not? So let's pick a base point. So let's pick the center as the base point. You can have a loop going around like this Okay, this is some kind of loop that goes around one time, but you can have another loop that goes around like this. So if this loop is called A and this loop is called B, it seems clear that A and B are not homotopic to each other. Uh, how, do you, how do you continuously move this loop A to be on the other side? I mean, there's no way to do it. There's that hole in the middle. It can only go around that hole, and you cannot make it go around the other hole. So it, it's not like the group of integers that if you go around one time, Every other loop is just a certain multiple of winding around that generator loop. So uh, that, that seems to be the incorrect answer. So intuitively, it, Z cannot be the answer. But then the question becomes, why, what is it? What is the group that does it for us? So that's what we're going to discuss. So here's the way we're going to do this with the Seifert von Kampen theorem. Now, I'm going to do something here that is perhaps a little bit controversial. I am going to draw a lot of pictures. Okay, we're going to draw a lot of pictures here. Now, the fact that we're drawing pictures does not mean that what we're doing lacks rigor. It is possible to do this very rigorously. But if you're going to do this very rigorously, then you have to describe this as some subset of, let's say, of the Euclidean plane. You, you actually have to write it out as a set and all of that. And working with that, it makes it way too tedious to write out every single detail. So the way I like to approach these kinds of problems is you, you might draw the pictures, but those pictures could be supplemented by more rigorous justifications if you need to, if you need to do it. Uh, the point of mathematics is not to write out every single detail, but to write out enough details that we can fill, it, we can fill in the missing gaps if we need to. So otherwise, it becomes very long. So that's what we're going to uh, discuss here. So I'm gonna, we're going to draw a lot of pictures, but I think uh, it will be clear how to make it rigorous. So let's draw the figure eight space. So this is the figure eight space. You can think of the figure eight space as a subspace of R2. And we need to come up with open sets that contain the point P. So this is going to be our point P. So you can think of it as the origin, but it really does not matter what it is. And then U is going to be the following open set. It's going to be this circle, but that's not an open subset. And then you have this piece of it. So the way you get an open subset of X is you intersect it with an open subset of the plane. So if you take this square, for example, open square, and you intersect it, what kind of picture do you get? You get this, right? You get this, and you get this arc with the two open endpoints to it. So that is what would happen if you were to intersect all of this. And then V would be the other one. V would go in the other direction. This is the one that would include the circle. And then it would go like this. Okay, so that would be V. And when you use the Seifert von Kampen theorem, you have to intersect them together. And when you intersect them together, it's where these two pictures overlap. So you have this X shape. You have this shape, and then you have that shape. So that's what you get. So these are the open sets, and that is their intersection. Notice that all of the hypotheses of the Seifert von Kampen theorem are satisfied. U and V are path connected. And their intersection is path connected and it contains the base point. So now we can start computing the fundamental groups of this. So we're going to have pi 1 of u intersect v. This is at our point. And this is going to be mapped into pi 1 of, of v at our point. And this one is going to be mapped to pi 1 of u at p at our point. And now we have to compute the pushout. Now, before we do anything, here's what we need to realize. We should realize that this is contractible. This is a contractible space. Because we can take these loops and we can sort of shrink them down to a single point. So that's a contractible space. It can be continuously shrunk down to a single point. So because of that, we can immediately say that this fundamental group is going to be trivial. So if you use, multiple, if you use additive notation, you would probably write it like this. Uh, which is what you do when it's a commutative group. If you use additive notation, you can maybe write one 
it has one identity element, one. Uh, it depends how you want to write it. I'll, I'll write it like this. I'm going to write it in a somewhat silly way. I'm going to say that uh, if you have a closed loop, let's call that loop C, then that closed loop is trivial. So I'll just write one. I'm going to use multiplicative notation. So we have, this is another way of saying it's generated by C, where C is the identity element. That's just another way of saying that this is the trivial group. It's a silly way to write it, but you'll see why I'm doing it like that. Because I just want to reinforce the, the push out and how you calculate it. Now, uh, this space it, 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 it's homotopic to a circle because for the same reason, this can be collapsed down to a single point. And you only have that circle going around. You have that circle going around it. So you would therefore say that, so what would you say? So you would say that the, that the fundamental group of this, of this space, it, it's isomorphic to, to, the, to the integers, but more specifically, if you want to describe it, you would say it like this. It's A, it's just generated with A, and there's no relation because it's the integers, the group of integers, it's a free group. It has no relationship. It has one generator, and it has no relationship. And you can actually find the generator in this picture. The generator in this picture would be the loop that goes around one time. So that would be A. So the, so the loop that goes around one time that begins and ends at that base point, that would be the generator for the space. And likewise, this is the same idea. The generator, it, it does not matter what orientation you pick because the, the, because the inverse is also a generator called B. That would be a generator for the fundamental group of this space. Okay, so I mean, I could just write that it's the integers. It, it's isomorphic to the integers, but I want to specifically write it like this to reinforce the picture. So you actually get to see what the generating loops are and how they're being used. So this would be, so this would be B. Okay, that would be B. So now you have to compute the push out. So you're going to compute the push out of this diagram. And we go back to our lecture that we had on combinatorial group theory when we talked about how you find the presentation of a push out. So the presentation of a push out is done in the following way. It's, it's uh, kind of like a co-product. You're going to, it's like a disjoint union. You're going to take this one and you're going to take this one and you're going to merge them together. So you're going to have the, a group that's generated by A and B, and now you're going to write down the relations. So you have to write down what the relations are. Now, the, there are no relations on this one, and there's no relations on that one. So if this, if this was just a coproduct, then that's the way you would write it. You would just say it's the group that's generated by A and B. But when you're doing a push out, you have to make sure that, because in the push out, you have a map going like this, and then you have a map going like that. And the diagram has to commute. So the map that goes this way and the map that goes that way, they both have to com uh, commute with each other. So the way this is accomplished is by looking where C is being mapped to. W uh, where is C mapped? Now, C in this, in this group, that's just the identity element. Okay, that's just the identity. So C, the generator, is 1. And 1 is mapped to 1 because one it, in a group homomorphism, the identity element always goes to the identity element. That's a well-known fact from group theory, but you can prove it very easily from first principles. So the identity element goes to the identity here, and it goes to the identity element over there. And so th these two identity elements, they get mapped to the identity element. So you do not, I mean, basically what you're saying is C gets mapped to A, right? C gets mapped to 1. So I'll write it like that. C gets mapped to 1. And then this C and, and, and this C, which is one, gets mapped to one, and both of these have to be the same in the coproduct. So basically, the requirement is one has to be equal to one. But there's no, that's completely redundant. So, so you can drop this condition. So this is really just the, the group whose presentation is AB. So notice there's no relations, right? So this is a group generated by A and B. It has no relations. What group is this? So this is the free group on, of rank of rank two. That's how we call it. Free, the free group of rank two. We write it like this: the free group of rank two, F two. Now, um, geometrically, if you draw pictures, it should make sense. So let's draw the figure eight space. So here's our figure eight space, and we have two loops. One of them goes like this. Okay. Uh, the orientation does not matter, and the other one goes like this. 
So we have two loops. It should be clear. So we call this one A and we call this one B. As we've said, it should be clear that A and B are not homotopic to each other. If you do A squared twice, that's not homotopic with B because then you're just going around twice. If you go around twice, how do you move this loop over to the other side? You're not able to do it. It's on the other side. I mean, there's no space in the middle to move over to the other side. Likewise, if you do AB and you do BA, these are not homotopic to each other. So AB means you go this goes first and then this goes second. And this means you do this for you do the blue one first and you do the red one first. So how do you move the picture so that the red and blue get interchanged? So basically, if, if you were to interchange the colors, right, if you were to interchange the colors like this, how do you continuously move this into that? So the red goes to that side and the blue goes to that side. There's no way to do it. There's this empty space. There's no way to move it. So it makes like visually, it makes sense that these should be different. And then if you carefully think about it over, you basically have all of these are different. All of these are different. And then you have A, B, B, A, A, B, A, B, B, A, and so on. So this is, what is this? This is a free group. There's absolutely no relations that can be put on those two generators. So that is the fundamental group of the figure eight. It, it, it's generated by these two loops. They have no relations, and it's a free group of rank two on those two generators. So this is our first example. It's somewhat interesting, but you possibly maybe could have uh, deduced it on your own. Now, more generally, we can talk about this. What if x is this? S1, one point union S2, one point union, I'm sorry, one point union S1, 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 and so on, S1. So this is called a bouquet of circles. And the reason for this is quite simple. If you have, let's say, if you, let's say, have four of them, you have this, this. Okay, that's a really bad drawing. Maybe I should try doing this a little bit better. Let's try doing a little bit better. Uh, fortunately, in topology, your circles do not actually have to look like circles, but they still should meet at a single point. Okay, like it's acceptable to draw bad pictures, but it's not acceptable to make your circles not even meet at a single point. So, I mean, that, that must be saying quite a lot. Like if someone is so bad at drawing, that they cannot even draw a topological picture. So one can show, okay, so one can show. So it's the same sort of idea. You're going to have your loops. The orientations that do not matter because you can always take the inverse. So these are going to be your loops. A, B, this is C, this is D. And then the fundamental group of this space at a point would be the free group that's generated by those uh, four loops. It's a free group of rank four. So you can kind of write it like this. It's the free group of rank four. This is non-abelian, by the way. This is not abelian. Okay? I should have said that earlier. This is not an abelian group. So the figure eight is not an abelian group. And this is a bouquet of four circles is not an abelian group. So this is like a, an example of a group, uh, of a fundamental group that does not become abelian when you Now, let's look at these things called graphs. So we can, we, can use the, we can use two tricks to compute the fundamental group of a graph, let's say of a connected graph. We like it when our spaces are connected. If they're not connected, if the graph is not connected, then you have to work with the connected component. You have to stick in the connected component. You will have to then forget about the other component that does not contain the base point and only work with that one. So uh, let us not definition of this. I do not want to give a rigorous definition of a graph. The simple reason is because we're not really going to use it again in the class. I mean, you can, you can maybe look it up somewhere, like how does one define a topological graph? Uh, to put it very simply, a topological graph consists of arcs. So arcs are subsets that are homeomorphic to the closed unit interval. And the arcs, when they intersect, if they intersect, they intersect at a single point. So that is a simplified uh, definition of what a graph is. Uh, so we can give the rigorous definition and all of that, but let's just draw pictures. So 
let's look at this. So this is a well-known graph. So we can use two tricks. So trick one, and these are very nice tricks. You're going to find a maximal tree in the graph and collapse it. And then trick two, you're then going to compute the fundamental group of a bouquet of circles. So these two tricks make it possible for you to find the fundamental group of any graph. So let's say we have this graph called K5. This is called complete graph on five vertices. So you have five vertices like this. And then you're going to, between any two of them, going to draw an edge. Uh, it does not have to be a straight line because this is topology. It's going to draw edges between them. And here you can kind of indicate that it goes underneath it. Though some people just draw it like this. And the convention is, so the convention is that if you draw a line and the line intersects, like I'm having difficulty drawing a straight line. Let me try that one more time. So the convention is, is that if your line intersects another line, it's understood that it either goes below it or above it. You can imagine that this is a graph sitting in three-dimensional space. Uh, with the graph, you, like the points that you actually care about, you're being highlighted. Uh, it's not intersecting, so you leave it unhighlighted. The places where it intersects, you put like these thick dots on it. So it's not inter if it actually intersected there, then you will fill it in. And that tells you that the graph goes there, and it goes there, and it actually intersects at the point. So that's like the convention with the graph. Like with knot theory, when we'll talk about knots, it actually matters whether or not a knot goes above or below a particular crossing. There it matters. But when you're dealing with graphs, it does not matter. So people generally draw it in an intersecting kind of a way. So consistent with that notation, I'll just draw it like that because it's easier to draw it like that. So you're going to draw it like this. So I think, though, yeah, I think that's all of it, right? This is the complete, the complete graph on all of them. And you're going to find the maximal tree. So what is a maximal tree? Again, I do not want to give the rigorous definition. I just want to give you a just a simple enough definition so we can get through this example and move to more interesting stuff. This is somewhat interesting, but it's not super interesting for what we want. So basically a tree, a tree is a type of graph that has no cycle. It has no closed loop in it. That's what you call a tree. So an example of a tree, it's exactly what you think it means. So this would be a tree. This is a tree. Uh, there's actually a book written all on trees. Like imagine what someone can possibly say. There's a book called Trees, such an innocent sounding book. And it's written by J.P. Sayer, who is, um, I would argue, uh, the greatest living mathematician in the world. So he is right now 96 years old. He is ancient, 96. And uh, he still does math. He still gives talks and lectures. He does math. He, I think recently, uh, maybe a few years ago, released a book. Um, so he is the greatest living mathematician. I would say the greatest mathematician of the 20th century was Grothendieck. But he died, unfortunately, in 2014. And Grothendieck and Sayer actually worked together quite a lot. And um, so Sayer, I would say, is the second greatest uh, mathematician of the 20th century. And I would say he's the greatest living mathematician today. He's done quite enormous amount of work. And uh, he actually written an entire book called Trees. Like, imagine how much someone can possibly say about trees. So I, trees are a very important type of graph that people have studied quite a lot. So this is something what a tree. Now, if you were to introduce this in here, right, that's no longer a tree. You have this, you see, you basically have a cycle that goes like this. Or perhaps it can also go like this also, right? You have, so that would be a cycle. You see, it goes around like that. So, uh, so that's what we call a tree. And what you're going to find is you're going to find a maximal tree. So maximal tree means it's a tree that's not contained in any larger tree. So let's draw this tree. 
see if we can highlight it in our picture. So there's lots of ways to do it, but you can do this. You can do this. Uh, so you want you also want your tree to contain all of the vertices, right? So you contain all of the vertices. So that would be a tree. And no matter what you add, it's no longer a tree, right? If you add this, it closes up. So this is a tree. And here is what happens. So if you look at the tree, so since the tree, so since the tree has no cycle in it, it is homotopic to a single point. It's a contractible space. Because what is this? This is just intervals. And they can be contracted down to a single point. So that would mean that all of these points right over here, they collapse to a single point. So when we contract all those vertices down to a single point, we are left with a bouquet of circles. Right? So because all of these are now being identified together. So we have one blue point. We have one blue point. And then all of the remaining edges, you see this edge, the two opposite uh, side, the two opposite vertices of the edge, they get glued together and you get a circle. These get glued together, you get a circle. These get glued together. So you just count how many edges you have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me count that again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, you have six. So you're going to end, end up with something like this. That's a, bouquet, that's a bouquet of six circles. Okay, so what does that mean? That means the fundamental group of this graph, K5, let's not worry about the point, is going to be isomorphic to the free group of rank six. So that's what we, what we have here. So that is quite nice, so we can work with the fundamental groups of graphs. Uh, these results are actually used in combinatorial group theory. Maybe I can make a comment. So there's something called combinatorial group theory. And there's something very similar to it, which is called uh, geometric group theory. Uh, both of these are, so these are both very active in modern research. Um, they're both similar. Um, you're, so you're interested to understand a group from its generator and relations. Uh, so combinatorial group theory, it's you can say it's more algorithmic. I would say it's more it's more about algorithm, like it's more about an algorithm and procedure of computation of how you solve the word problem. Whereas geometric group theory, you can say is or interested in properties of a group. But you're not interested in necessarily solving, so not really in solving the word problem, as we've talked about. You're more interested in the properties that the group has. So like, for example, if you were to write down um, some, kind of, some kind of group through generators and relations, and let's say uh, in, in a certain way, you want to be able to conclude that this group, for example, is abelian or is not abelian, it's finite or not finite, or maybe it has some other property that you might be interested in, maybe it's finite in some other sense, and, and, and things like that. And you try to do this without using any kind of computational methods. You, what you really try to do this, and it's quite interesting, is you generally uh, relate a topology, so you really relate some topological space to your group, and then use topology to help solve the problem. So uh, you're kind of using topology to help you solve group theory. That, that's basically to put it like that. You're using topology as a means to help you solve a problem in some, some properties about a group presentation. That's uh, probably one way to put it. So, and in geometric group theory, you do work with uh, graphs a lot, with trees a lot. Uh, there's these things called Cayley graphs that come up, but we're not gonna go there. I just sort of bring it up so you get so you hear about it. So let's look at this example. So I wanna give you a misapplication 
So this one is interesting. This is a misapplication of the ciphered von Kampen theorem. So this is when things go wrong. So let's say our space is the circle. And for you, we're going to pick the upper piece. So let's say this is the equator. Well, not the equator, but that's sort of the diameter. And we pick u to be a little bit bigger than the diameter. And we pick v from the other side to be a little bit bigger than the diameter because they have to be open sets and they have to intersect. And then we intersect them. So if we intersect them, if we find where they intersect, well, we have a piece over here and we have a piece over here, right? It's like this portion. So these are the pieces that they have in common. So when you intersect them, you get these two. Now let's see what happens when we calculate by using the ciphered von Kampen theorem. So we're going to have this. We're going to say that that pi 1 of u, well, that's just, I'll just write 0. It's trivial. Pi 1 of v is trivial because this is contractible, this is contractible. And then we'll say pi 1 of u intersect v is trivial. It does not matter whether you pick the base point here or here. This thing just contracts down to, to 0. So this is going to be trivial. So they're all trivial, which will imply, so you basically have a diagram that goes like this. So the co-product here will of, course, will, of course, be the 0 group. So then the conclusion is that the fundamental group of the space x, which is a union of those two circles by the ciphered von Kampen theorem, is trivial. But this is clearly wrong. We know that the fundamental group of the circle are the integers. So what exactly went wrong? So we are misapplying the ciphered von Kampen theorem. In the ciphered von Kampen theorem, it is a requirement that u and v have to intersect. They have to, in, they have to be path connected. And as you can see, they are not path connected. So the theorem cannot be applied, and that's why we get the wrong answer. However, we could apply it in a case of a circle. No, I'm sorry, not a circle, of a sphere. So let's say that x is a sphere. x is a sphere. And we're going to show that the fundamental group of the sphere, something we have alluded to many times, is trivial. However, interestingly, this is not contractible. So this is an example of a space that is not contractible, so it cannot be contracted down to a single point. However, the loops can all be contracted down to a single point. So the sphere is simply connected because the loops can be contracted to a point, but the space itself cannot be contracted down to a single point. However, we also said we will be unable to prove this. Even though this seems pretty straightforward, we will not have the tools to prove this. Because if you only use the fundamental group, the fundamental group will tell you that the fundamental group of x is trivial, and a contractible space has also a trivial group. So that the fundamental group is not good enough to distinguish between the two spaces. So that is uh, something that you can do by using higher homotopy groups, or generally what people do by using higher homology groups, something you do in topology part two. So let's therefore uh, discuss how to find the fundamental group. So it's actually it's the same picture we drew before, but it's just two-dimensional this time. You will be this piece a little bit beyond the equator, right? It's the upper portion and a little bit beyond the equator. V is, let's say, this piece and a little bit beyond the equator. You have to do it because they have to be open sets, okay? That's why you have to do that. This is, let's say, this is the point P. So this point is part of both of them. And if you intersect U and V, you actually get, so you get the equator. Let me say this, you have the equator and you have a little bit beyond the equator, right? A little bit beyond the equator. So like a cylinder pretty much, but the cylinder is of course contractible down. It has the same homotopy as the ring that goes around it. So then we'll just have the ring that goes around it. But the important uh, point here to realize is that the intersection is path connected. So because the intersection is path connected, we are permitted to use the ciphered von Kampen theorem. And let's start calculating these fundamental groups. So the fundamental group of U is trivial. The fundamental group of V is trivial. And the fundamental group of U intersect V, well, that's going to be isomorphic to the group of integers. But if you want to more specifically describe what it is in terms of a loop, you can say that this is generated by a loop. Let's call that loop C. And that's the loop that goes around 
the equator, right? One time, right? That's the loop that goes around the equator one time. We call that B. So now let's create our diagram. So at the bottom, at the bottom of the of the diagram, we have the intersection, and then we have maps going into U and V. So you, I could just put down zero over here, but maybe just to indicate how the pushout is being used even more carefully, I'll write that this is generated by A with the requirement that A is equal to one, right? It's, um, you can either write zero or one. It's just a question of whether you're using additive notation or whether you're using multiplicative notation. Here, I write down zero because if it's a, if it's a trivial group, if it's a trivial group, then it's abelian. So you can use additive notation and then you use the number zero. But in general, when you're working with group presentations, the groups do not have to be finite. And so it is generally a better convention to just write A is equal to one. Like when you write your generators, when you write down your relations and you set them equal to um, the identity, you generally set them equal to one because you generally do not know ahead of time that the group described by those, um, by those relations is necessarily going to be abelian. So we do the same thing with the other one. I'll just write this as B. I'll use a different letter, B, where B is equal to one. And how do you find the co well, the, the push out? The way you find the push out is you first find the co-product between these two. So you just copy and you just copy them down and you say A is equal to one, B is equal to one. And then you have to add another condition is you have to see you have to look at where C gets mapped to. So this generator, C, is being mapped to one in this group. Right, because there's only one element here. And C is being mapped to one in that group. And then both both of these ones, these are identity elements, and they're both being mapped to one. So then if you go around this way and you go around that way, they should be equal. So the image of going around this way, this is one, and the image of going around that way is one again. So then you're saying that this is the the, the group. Now you just this is silly. There's no need to write this. And then you're saying you have a group that's generated by A and B. By A and B are both the identity. So what is this? This is just a trivial. This is just a trivial group. So that means that the fundamental group of S2 at any point is trivial. And this is what we have mentioned before, but now we can actually prove it. Okay, so the sphere is a trivial group. Okay, so that, that does that. Now, uh, let's, now let's look at, at a much more interesting example. This one is way, way more interesting, probably the most interesting one. And we're going to spend a lot of time on this one. We're, in fact, we're going to solve it two different ways. The first method is very straightforward, but it's not super exciting. And it's the second method that's going to be a lot more interesting. So here is the here is the torus. So let x be a torus. And we're going to find the fundamental group of x. We're going to find the fundamental group of x. So, so this is the easiest method. So this is method one. This is the easiest way to do this. But it is not deep. It's not a deep method. So a deep method is a method that allows you to do lots of examples all at once. And you basically, you think of the torus as the product space of two circles, right? That's one way of thinking of the torus. And if you did that homework exercise, the, the fundamental group, let's not write the base point. The fundamental group of the product is the product of the fundamental groups. And what is this? These are the integers times the integers. So the fundamental group of the torus is therefore the two copies. It's a product of two copies of the integers. So this is the easiest method. Now I'm going to show you a much more interesting method because it allows you to do many other examples. And furthermore, it also allows you it also, it's more visual. You can actually see what's going on. This one just sort of tells you what the fundamental group is. But sometimes you might have this question of, well, what are the, the, the loops that, that generate the fundamental group? And why are, and why is it abelian? So this is actually abelian, right? So this is, so this is, this is an abelian group. So this is method two. And so this is method two. And we're going to do this very carefully. At some point in this derivation, I'm going to show you how people get sloppy in the derivation, because it's like a general trick that works in 
many other examples. But then I will justify for you the sloppiness more carefully. So sometimes when you know why something works, you do not want to repeat the entire long, tedious argument all over again. You sort of just jump to the final answer. So what a lot of people do is they often skip a lot of intermediate steps. They jump to the final answer and they just assert that that's the fundamental group. But we're going to do that very carefully so you actually get to see how all of the steps are being used. And this is something that in many books, uh, in many presentations of this, people do not put in, I think, enough details into this method. So we're going to try to really try to get the, the, the most out of understanding this. So the way we're going to think of our torus is we're going to think, so we're going to think of, so T, this is going to be our torus. And we're going to think of it as a quotient space. We're going to think of X mod a certain relation. So X is going to be this square, okay? It's going to be this square, the closed square. And we're going to, the relation is going to be identifying opposite sides in pairs. So that's, so that's the way we're going to think of this. So uh, X, we have this square. And then, as we've said before, points on the opposite edges, these two red points, are put into the same class, into the same equivalence class. Likewise, if we have a point here and the opposite point, they put in the same equivalence class. However, this point and this point are not put into the same equivalence class. So these four points do not go together. These two go together and these two go together, and that is it. And there's one exception made on the corners. On the corners, all four of these are put into the, uh, a single So. Every equivalence class in here, it consists of either a singleton point, if it's inside, it consists of a double point, if it's on the edges, and it consists of a quadruple point, of a single quadruple point, if it's one of those four corners that are being put together. So that is what this looks like as a set, if you want to think of it as a set. And then the topology here is the, is the quotient topology, which means that you have a mapping from X into the quotient, Okay, so uh, I know that we're overloading notation again. This is not the fundamental group. That's the projection map. So this is the mapping that sends a point into its equivalence class. So this is a surjective mapping. And then you topologize this by saying that an open subset of this, you say a subset of this is open if and only if the pullback of it, by, when you pull it back, it's an open subset of that X. So that's the way pi is being defined. So this is our tortoise. So we're going to construct two open sets. First, we need a point. And I find that... I find it easier to pick a point that's not a corner point, which is a little bit counterintuitive because you would think that when you pick a base point, maybe you pick one of those four that come together. But I just find it easier that when you're drawing pictures, it's easier to draw pictures when you actually pick a point somewhere inside it. So we're going to pick a point close to the corner, but not actually on the corner. So we're going to pick a point right there. Uh, so, so it's not even the point that is um, in the middle. I think it's better when you draw it something like this. And now we need two open sets. So one of the open sets, so we're going to have two open sets. I'm going to redraw the picture again. This is going to be our square, okay? That's going to be our square. This is our point P. And then one of the open sets is going to go like this. It's going to be this open square. I'm not going to draw the dotted lines, but this is an open square, U, that contains that point. So realize that U, this U, is an open subset of X. Right? This u is an open subset of x. And then pi of u is going to get mapped to, by definition, an open subset. So pi corresponds this set to an open subset of that, of that space. So this is an open subset of the torus. So not u is an open subset, but pi of u is going to be an open subset of the torus. But, but this is the way we draw it. This is sort of the easier way to draw it. So this is an open set. Uh, I'm being a little bit sloppy. I mean, technically, technically, you should really say, pi of u is an open set in T. Okay, so this quotient, this quotient over here, so you're thinking of your torus as this quotient. So really it's pi of u, it's an open set in T. But we're gonna be a little bit sloppy. We understand that whatever this is, it's the corresponding image in, in, in the quotient. Okay, we'll be sloppy. So I'll just write u to simplify notation. So that's gonna be u. And now I'm gonna draw for you the picture for V. That's the other open set. So the other open set is going to be this point over here, but we're going to draw a smaller square. This is a smaller square, but instead of filling it inside, we're going to fill it on the outside. So that's going to be V. And because this is an open subset of the square, pi of V will get mapped to an open subset 
of the torus. Okay, so that is, this is an open subset of our torus. So now we have these two open sets. It is clear that U and V, they both contain the base point, and furthermore, they are path-connected sets. Um, so far, so good. Now we have to look at their intersection and see what we get. So let's see if we can find their intersection. So the intersection is, you're going to have to put this one inside that one, and then you look at all of the stuff in the middle. So when you put them one inside the other, it's going to go like this. You're going to have your base point, and then you're going to have all of this. You're going to have all of that. That's what you're going to have. So that's going to be your intersection. Your intersection is also, it's also uh, a path connect. Okay, so this is very nice. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to use the ciphered von Kampen theorem. We're going to start calculating the fundamental groups. So let's start with the fundamental group of U. So the fundamental group of U is going to be trivial. Because if we look at this U, pi, this mapping pi, it's an isomorphism on this open square. Because every single one of these points over here, it's being said injectively, right? All, every single one of these points is only equivalent to itself. So this, um, this map, this quotient map, it's going to... Uh, send all of this to an isomorphic copy of itself. So since this is a contractible space, pi of u is a contractible space. Now you notice I'm writing it like this. If you want, if you want to be really funny, you really would write it like this, pi one of pi of u, and that looks ridiculous. So that's actually the reason why I'm not, I'm being a little bit sloppy and I'm suppressing the quotient map notation. So it's just pi one of u. This is a contractible space, so you can just say that this is zero. And if you want to write it out, um, maybe using a group presentation, you can say, uh, let me um, call it, let me call it D. I'll call it D with the condition that D is equal to one. I'll write it like this. Now let's look at this V over here. So this one is actually quite interesting. Uh, pi one of V. So you, so here's the important point. V has, is homotopic, is homotopic to a wedge of two circles. That's the crucial part. Why is it homotopic? The reason for this is look back to this picture again. You see, look at this picture. You see you have this hole? Well, that hole can be pushed further out by a homotopy, right? You can just take all of those and you can push them out. And what are you left with when you do that? When you, when you do that, you're going to be left with just a square. But on the square, these two points get identified. That gives you a circle. And then these two points get identified. That gives you another circle. So you get two circles, but they're going to be connected at one point. Um, if, another way to see that, perhaps, is basically, so let me try drawing a picture of a torus for you. So here's a picture of a torus. If you want to visualize this on that torus, you basically have something going like this. You have a collar going like this. And then you have like another collar going all the way around. Right, you have some thickness, right? You have some thickness going all the way around. But when you shrink that collar down to just, um, right? So when you take this collar, this thickness, and you shrink it down to a line by a homotopy, you have a ring, and then you have like another ring going around. So you have two rings that are joined at a single point. So that's kind of the idea for what's happening in this picture. And so V is homotopic to S1, V, S1. So this means that... Okay, so if it's S1 and S1, that means the fundamental group is a free group with two generators. So this group is a free group with two generators, with two generators. But more specifically, let's actually draw what those two generators are. So we have two generators, A and B. There's no relations. And where are those two generators? Well, basically, the two generators are the two rings that go. So one of them goes around like this, and the other one goes around in the, around the other ring. So in this picture that we have for V. I'm going to get rid of this point. It's getting in the way. Uh, so the two, the two loops, one of them goes like this. So that's the loop A. And the other one at that point is the loop B. That's going to be the loop B. So you give them some kind of orientation. It does not matter which one, right? We're basically saying this. One of the loops goes like this. This is a loop because this point and that point are being identified. So the image of this curve 
in the, so when I write A over here, of course what we mean is we mean the image of that path in the quotient space. We really mean pi of A, but we're not gonna write that. That's, that's too, that looks too ridiculous. So these two endpoints are being attached together in the quotient, and so this is a closed loop. It begins at P, it goes there, it continues off on the other side. And when you go up, you're going up, and then you continue off on the other side. So those are the two loops that go around it. Okay, so those are going to be the two loops. So that's how you get, so that would be the fundamental group of V, right? That's the fundamental group of V. And now we need the fundamental group of the intersection. Now the intersection, pi one of U intersect V, well, that would just be isomorphic to the integers. Because if you look at this topologically, this, well, it's a ring, right? It's a ring, but, but this is homotopic, right? Homotopic, so U intersect V is homotopic to the circle. It, it has a homotopy to the circle. So because it has a homotopy to the circle, it means there's like one generator that will do it for you. And you see what the generator is. That's the generator that goes all the way around. So if we were to draw it in our picture, let's call this generator C. So this is the loop. So let's kind of maybe draw it like this. It goes like this, it goes up. I messed that up. So it goes, let me draw it like this. It goes like this, up, goes like this. So that is your, that is your loop that goes around the hole. So that's the loop that goes around the hole. And then we would say that this is generated by C. It has a single generator, and that generator is C. So now we can uh, put these together into a, into a pushout and calculate what the fundamental group is. So here's how we do it. We, at the bottom, we put down C, right? That's the intersection, the fundamental group of the intersection. Then here we're going to have two maps. Uh, one of these maps is going to be pi one of u, so that's the trivial one. So we'll just write it as d, d is equal to one. The other one, that's the fundamental group of v, so that would be generated by a, b. Okay, so we have uh, the free group uh, generated, so there's two generators, but geometrically you can actually show in a nice picture what those two generating loops are. And then you have um, the fundamental group, so what else do you have? You have the, and then you have the fundamental group of the space that you're trying to find. So it's going to be the pushout. So to find the pushout, here's the way you do it. You do it exactly as before. So the pushout, so you push this out. So here's the way the pushout goes. You're gonna you're gonna copy you're going to copy D, right? So you have so you have A, B, and D. You have three generators, A, B, and D. And now you put the relations. Now one of the generators, D, is a fake generator. It's it's just D is equal to one. And then you have, okay, and then you have no relations over here. You have no relations. So it seems like the fundamental group of the torus is has two generators on it but this is where here we actually need to pay very close attention to what's happening with c this loop c okay so what is c in the in our picture c in our picture it's the loop that goes around this ring so the image of this loop so this loop is a loop in u right it's a loop in u so it's a loop in here but as a loop in u it's homotopically trivial so it gets mapped to something trivial c gets mapped to c C is just D is equal to one. This one just gets mapped to one. So C is being mapped to one in this, in this group. Now, where is C being mapped to in this group? So C has to be expressed. You have to be able to express C in terms of these generators, right? These generate the group. So the image of C in this group has to be expressed in terms of A and B. So you have to figure out how to express C using the loops. So the way you do it is, so I really have to zoom in over here so you get to see it. Um, so this is C, okay, this is C. Uh, maybe, maybe it would be better to take down this picture. This picture is no longer necessary. This picture is just gonna, I'm gonna just use this empty space. This is C, it goes like this. So let's draw C. So this is C. So how do you express C using A and B. These are the two generators. This is a loop in this space, right? This is a loop in this space, right? It's a loop, so you have that square. It's a loop in that space. So how do you express C using A and B? Well, here's the simple version. I, I'm gonna be a little bit sloppy, and then afterwards I'm gonna justify it a little bit, I'm gonna justify it more carefully. This is the, this is the really sloppy version. The really sloppy way to say it is, you see you're moving like this along C, 
right? You're moving like this along C, and here you are moving along A. Now, you're going to complain, and you're going to say, but C is only moving from that point to that point, right? C, well, technically, C is, is a closed loop, right? C is technically, it's one complete loop. But if you just look over, um, on the lower edge, it's not moving from that point to that point. The, the actual loop moves from this point, well, it starts at P, and it continues all the way through P, whereas C does not continue back. It kind of goes off along a different path. So we will we will fill in the details, but if you're sloppy, you would say that you're moving this way, okay, you're moving this way along A, right, you're moving this way along A, so moving at the bottom, so let me get rid of the, the stuff in blue, it's just getting in the way. Uh, so you're moving, so you're moving along the piece at the bottom, that's A, then you're moving up, you're moving up, so you're moving in the direction of this B, so that's your loop B. Now, I know you're going to say, well, B is on the other side. Well, it's true, but kind of if you push B to the left, right, you can imagine it's a homotopy. So if you, you can homotope B to the left. But when you homotope B to the left, it just continues off on the other side. And there it is. And now you're moving this way. You see, it, it's moving like this. Now you're moving this way, right? You're moving back like this. But when you're moving back, you're kind of, it's this loop, but with the opposite orientation. So it's now going like this. So when you're moving back, that is A inverse. That's the inverse loop. It's the reversal of the path. It's the reverse path loop. And then you're going down. You're going in the opposite direction of that. So that's the reverse path loop. That's going to be B inverse. So the way you express C is C consists of this one. It's a juxtaposition. It's this, 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 and this. So you would say it's A, B, A inverse, B inverse. That's the way you write it, right? It's, it's the juxtaposition of these four. And so if you're willing to accept that sloppy argument, there's some questionable steps that we will have to fill in. But if you're willing to accept that sloppy argument, C is being mapped to, and it, technically it's pi of C, of course, but C is being mapped to A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So that means C, so one, right, that's one, has to be identified with that in the in the push out. So you would have A, B, A inverse, B inverse is equal to one, right? So this one and these two, so C is mapped to one, C is mapped to this, and then you have to take these two and you have to identify them in the co-product in the push out. This condition can be dropped, right? Well, let me not skip steps. So we would then say that this is then isomorphic with AB, and the con you drop the, the D, it does not do anything for you, and then you have AB, A inverse B inverse is equal to one. But you can rewrite this. This can be rewritten. This can be rewritten as AB is equal to BA, because you can move you can meet, move the B over to the other side, you have B, and then you move the A over to the other side. So then you have AB is equal to BA. So what is this? This is, if you say it in words, this is a commutative group generated by A and B. And there are no other relations. Right? What group is this? Well, that's just Z, right? That's Z times, that's Z times Z. Um, if you do not like that, here's an alternative way to do that. How do you calculate the product? So recall how to compute the product group from a presentation. So here's how you compute a product group. So you want to find the product of Z with itself, of Z with itself. So you write Z as generated by A. You write Z as generated by B. You use two different symbols. And the way you find the product is, it's like a co-product. You put them together, so you have AB. And then you put the condition that the generators here and the generators here have to commute. And that's the product. So this is just another way of saying it's the product of those two. So therefore, the fundamental group of the torus is isomorphic to the product of two copies of Z. Now, maybe even better, it tells us it tells us what the two generating loops are. It's the A and the B loop. So the A loop is the one that goes around. So it's, the, it's one of these rings. And the B loop that goes up and down, that's the other ring. So when you have the torus, when you draw a ring around the small one and you draw the ring around the big one, then those two loops will be the generator loops that you get. And the group that you get is abelian. Uh, and I'll give you a nice picture that will illustrate to you why it's abelian. Uh, that's actually a little bit surprising why it's abelian. But before we get to that point, I want to give you a more careful justification, a more careful explanation why C can be written like this. Let me take all of this down and let me try doing this again with a really big picture. 
So this is a really big picture. So this is our square. Our square. Here's our point P. And then we have a path. We have a closed loop. So technically, the image of this in the quotient is a closed loop. And we call this A. Let's say that's the orientation. And we have another one that goes like this. Call that one B. Call this one B. And we have a closed path, C, that's doing this. It, it goes like this. Uh, well, it starts off exactly with A, but maybe yeah, but maybe what I should do is I can, should probably make it go a little bit higher so you can tell them apart. It goes like this. Okay, so this is C. C is this one single loop, right? It's not four separate loops, it's one single loop. Okay, so what do you do next? Well, you're going to take the C. So this is like the, the missing details. These are like the details that nobody wants to write because they're tedious. But... What you do is you break up C at four points. You treat it like a square. So you have C1, C2, C3, and C4. And then you get to say that C, the entire closed loop that begins and ends at that point, is homotopic to C1 juxtapose C2, juxtapose C3, juxtapose C4. Now the part that you have to be very careful with, careful with is that these, be careful, the C sub J are not closed loops, are paths. They're paths that begin and end at different points. Now we're going to use a trick that we did with the Seifert von Kampen proof. We took a path, we broke, well, we took, we took a closed loop and we broke, and we broken it into paths. So they were not closed loops anymore. So we break it, we, we broken it into paths, and then we inserted extra paths and the reversal paths so that everything together did not change the homotopy. But the important part the important uh, point was that by inserting the appropriate missing paths you can then turn those into closed paths. Because when you work in the fundamental group, they have to be closed paths. So that's like the missing detail to, to make this a more careful type of justification. So let's see how we do this. So C goes from, uh, from point P to whatever that point is. So let's call that point P1, for lack of a better name. And now to create a closed loop, we're going to go from C1, and then we'll just continue this. We're just going to continue this path. So when, when it hits this wall, you can imagine it continues across. So we just do this. Okay? So this extra path, let's call it D1. Like I'm running out of letters. I'm not sure what to call them. I'm just trying to sort of give you the idea of how this works. So then C is going to be homotopic to C1 juxtaposed D1. So you're going to move along D1. So now C1, you see the C1, the C1 goes up to that point. It continues with the point now along a different path that now returns back to P. So this is now a closed loop that begins and ends in P, which is the way it's supposed to be. But then you have to insert the path reversal. So nothing is being changed, right? So by putting this in, you're not changing the homotopy class. So let's put this, let's put a bracket around this. So this is now a, this is now a loop. Right? We've just created a loop, so that's good. We just create a loop. Then we have this path reversal. So the path reversal, D1, it now will go backwards. It will go this. It will go up to that point. Then we will flow from P1 to whatever point that is. Let's call that point P2. We will flow along C2. So then we will juxtapose this with C2, but that's not a closed path. And then we have to flow back. So then we just go like this, and we call that D2, let's say, for lack of a better name, going like that. And so then this would be D2, right? But now when you close it off like this, this is now a loop. You see, that's a loop. That's a loop because D1, it begins at P, it continues to P1, then it continues to P2, and then D2 will take you back to P. So now you have a closed loop. Okay, so that is now a closed loop that you get. And then 
you would have juxtapose the reversal one, then you would have D3, and then you have another path, it's called a D3, and so on. So you have these loops, so you've created loops. So these are, this is a loop, this is a loop, and so on. So then you can therefore say that the homotopy class of C is the homotopy class of C1 juxtapose D1. You're not allowed to write C1 D1, that would make no sense, because in the fundamental group, there is no homotopy classes of paths. They have to be loops. So that's the reason why you have to keep them together. And then you would have D1 reversal C2 D2 and so on. You have the other ones. Now, let's see what happens. I'm not going to write out every single detail. I just want to give you enough information so you see what happens. C1, C1, D1. So what is it in the picture? Let's really highlight this like extremely well. So C1. So C1, we're going like this. We're going like this. And then we're continuing on this side. But if you look at the picture, so look at this picture. This is basically the path A. This is basically the path A. It's just a slight detour. You can easily imagine taking this thick red line and homotoping. You can define a homotopy that directly down to A, right? So whatever this is, whatever that is, that is A. Now what happens with the other one? Let's shade in with a different color what happens with this one. So this is D1 reversal. So D1 reversal it goes like, well, it actually goes like this. It goes like this. So D1 reversal. So we go like this, like this. That's D1 reversal. Then we go along this one. And then we go back, right? We kind of go back to P. Um, and so how, but how do you get, how do you get the P? Well, you can you can actually see the homotopy. It take so think of so this will help you see it. Uh, you see this line, this red line. You can imagine taking this red line, bending it. Right, you can bend it. It's a homotopy. You can bend it, and if you bend it over to the other side, right? If you bend it over to the other side, it continues here, right? So you're kind of this thing right over here. You're bending it over, so it continues over, and then it continues back up, and then you're bending it back again. So you can actually see that homotopy. So whatever that is, this one over here is going to be B. And then you have to just, I mean, and then you have to show that this is, right? You just have to kind of go through the picture and then see that this is, that this one over here will be A, A inverse because of the opposite orientation that you have. So that right there is like the careful, the more careful justification for why it's written like that. It's sort of the same trick that we used with the Seifert von Kampen theorem. Now, the sloppy version, this is the this is the really sloppy version, is that this is what people do. They draw this square, they say these two sides are being glued together. You call them A. This side, actually, sorry about that. Uh, call this B. Uh, no, you call this B. So here's the way it goes. Look at the orientation as you go around. This is A, this is B. And then when you continue, this side is being copied. When you continue on the other side, you're moving in the opposite way. So people write A inverse. Again, I'm saying this is super, this is like the shortcut method. The shortcut method is not rigorous. It's just like in algebraic notation, it just tells you what happens. The, 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 the rigorous, the, like the more rigorous justification is what we've been doing for the past 30 minutes. But basically, you move this way, that's A. You move that way, that's B. And then this side, which is being glued with that A, when you go counterclockwise, as you can see, the orientation does not match. So just imagine you have, yeah, so I think this will make it easier. Imagine going counterclockwise. Imagine going counterclockwise. Pick an orientation. So as you go counterclockwise, this is like the loop that goes around it. If, if you recall in our argument, that's exactly what we had. We had this loop going around the ring. So you draw this loop going around the ring. The A goes, these two are being glued in this direction. So this is the A, it goes in the orientation. This is the B, it goes in the orientation. But this one, when you, it's, it's the, the direction in which it's being glued is opposite of how you move in the circle. So this is why you write down A inverse, and this one is going to be B inverse. And then you say that the fundamental group is just going to be AB, and then you write down the, you just, you take the product of all four of those. 
and then you say a b a a b a inverse b inverse is equal to one, and then you do that. Okay, so that's what a lot of topologists would do. If you ask them to derive it for you, they would be super sloppy. They would not write out details. They'll just write that down. But if you want to understand how the ciphered Van Kampen theorem is actually being used, that's what we've uh, shown. And the interesting thing here is the fundamental group. So AB is BA. This is very amazing. In the torus, so, so let's draw the torus again. So here's our torus. So one of these, so one of these rings in, in the picture, this is supposed to be the loop A, and then you have another loop that goes around like this. That's the loop B. So what's amazing is, is that A and B are not homotopic to each other. It is not possible to take this red loop and deform it so that it becomes the blue loop. However, and this is the part which is quite amazing, if you do AB, then that is homotopic to BA. So visually, what this means is, if you redraw the same torus, so let's say A goes first and B goes second. Let's say you do B going first. So let's say you draw the ring, you draw the ring B like this, and then you draw the other ring going around like that. Amazingly, what happens is that even though you have no homotopy, you have no continuous deformation to get from the red loop to the blue loop, the amazing thing is, is that if you have the red loop and the blue loop together, if you're using them together, then there is a continuous way of how you can deform these two loops to interchange those two. So that's like the amazing thing. So individually, it cannot be done. But together, when they're together, you can do it. It almost seems like it seems so counterintuitive that it, work, it feels like something is wrong. But I can show you in the two-dimensional picture, I think it's easier to see. So when we draw the square again, it becomes easier to see. So instead of drawing the base point over here, let me actually draw the base point on one of the edges. So this edge plays the role of A, and this edge plays the role of B. Now notice, if you only have the red edge, there's no way to continuously move this one into the blue one, because the blue one is on the side. You, you're not allowed to you're not allowed to deform it like you're not allowed to take it and deform it like that because that is not I mean that is not a closed loop these two points do not close up so now you're, so you're not allowed to do that uh, so there's no way to deform this red line into that line however look what happens when you have both of them if you have both of them this is a and b this is what you can do if you're using both of them take that point and slide it to the other corner and notice what starts to happen it goes like this Right, that's your deformation. Then you deform it like this. And then you keep on deforming it. And then eventually you get to here. And you get to there. Right? You eventually get to the other side. But then when you do it over to the other side, this one gets identified with the opposite edge. So look at what you did. You started something that was red on top and blue on the right. And by doing this continuous deformation, you now have something that is red, blue at the bottom, so namely blue on top also, and red on the left. So you found a way to interchange those two colors, right, those two loops, by using a continuous process. So you cannot do them with individually. For the, 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 You cannot convert the red one into the blue one and, and the other way around. However, when you have both of them together, amazingly, you can convert one, you can convert both of them together uh, in, in that sort of a way. And I'm going to show you an animation an, an animation in three-dimensional space that I was able to find in a video that actually shows this to you. So if you give me a moment, I'll find it for you and I'll play it on your screen. So please be patient while I find the video for you to so give me a little, a few moments. Okay, so I found the video, so let me share it for you. So this is going to be the fundamental group of the torus. So that's the name of the video. It's called the fundamental group of the torus is abelian. So there is the sheet of paper that we're going to form into the torus. So that's the homotopy that we were showing, that if you take those two and you move them from one corner to the other corner, that is what shows the abelian property of the torus. Now, uh, this presentation does not have two different colors. 
So it would have been definitely more helpful to have two different colors. But there it is. Those are the two rings coming together. And now look at this. You are continuously deforming. The ring that goes around the inner one is going to be changed into the ring that goes around the outer one. So that is what just happened. So that's why the yeah, so that's why the torus. You see, I mean you maybe you can maybe you can see this that this that this thing, yeah, so there it is. Maybe if we go back a little bit. Yeah, so let's go back over here. So you follow this ring. You see this ring? I'm, I, I'm keeping my mouse on that ring. So there it is. I'm keeping my mouse on that ring. So there it is. There, there's that. That's the ring we had in the very beginning. And there it is. Now it's on the outside. So that's the reason why the torus is an abelian. It's, it's an abelian group. Okay, so that's the torus. And let's so here's a shortcut so um an alternative method another method to find the fundamental group of the sphere so this is a shortcut method based on what we just said so here's how you do it we're going to draw a circle then we have the upper side and the lower side we're going to if we identify the opposite sides in this way so this one and this one are being glued together this one so if we glue them together like this then we end up getting right if we glue them like this then we end up getting the sphere right that's the sphere uh, we talked about this before so here is the sloppy version of how you do it uh the shortcut the shortcut would be you would call the lower edge so here's how you do it you're going to draw a circle you're going to draw some kind of orientation inside and when you draw the orientation inside this is the lower edge and it's being glued with the upper edge. But the upper edge, which is supposed to be glued like this, it's now going in the opposite orientation of the circle that you drew. So this is really, you're going to really write A inverse on the top. And then you would say the fundamental group is generated. Well, you only have one symbol. So you would say it's generated by A. Okay. And the relationship that is satisfied is A, A inverse is equal to 1. Um, so that does not, yeah, that does not, it, so this actually then does not work out. So it looks like, yeah, it looks like I am not an expert on the sloppy method. That's what it looks like. It's, it's not working out because then this goes away. Well, you can see what the problem is. This goes away, right? That goes away. And then you're, and then we've concluded that the fundamental group of the sphere is isomorphic to the integers because it has one generator, but that's wrong. That's not true. So it looks like I'm, uh, I do not know how to use the sloppy method. Um, but I'm going to leave you with the following exercise. We're going to find, so remember we talked about the projective plane, right? The projective plane. Now, the way you get the projective plane is it's like what we did with the circle, but it goes, in, it goes like this. So points that are opposite get glued together. The opposite points get glued together. And I think you call both of them A. So I think the answer goes like this. I think this is the way you do it. You would just say it's A, and the relation is that A squared is 1. Yeah, A squared is 1. So it's A times A equal to 1. And so what is this? This is isomorphic to Z mod 2Z. So that's what that is. Uh, now, that's the ridiculously, uh, you can say, sloppy way of doing it. And as an exercise... Yeah, so this is what you would say, the fundamental group of the projective plane. So the projective plane is what happens when you take the disk, the disk, you take the upper semicircle, the lower semicircle, and you glue them in opposite sides like this. So it's kind of like gluing the upper and lower edges to get a sphere, but they're being twisted through itself and then glued together. So that's why this is sometimes called the cross cap, cross cap. So that's the name of that surface. It cannot be embedded in, Euclid in three-dimensional Euclidean space, so you cannot actually see it. But even though you cannot see it, you can still calculate the fundamental group. And the way you do it is, so this is the sloppy method that I've seen people do it. They, they draw the letter A at the bottom. They draw the letter A on top because you're going, the orientation is consistent with the circle. And then you would say, because you have one symbol, you have one generator, and the relation is the symbol that's being repeated twice. So if you go this way and you go this way, so that's A squared. So A squared is equal to 1. And this is the group uh, 
presentation for integers mod 2. That's what it is. So as a homework exercise, this is what you want to do. So here's an exercise. Give a careful derivation using the ciphered von Kampen theorem for this fact. Okay, so you're basically going to argue that that is the, that this is your group. And you'll have to justify it carefully in the same way uh, how we justified uh, why the torus had the group that it had. You will gain a lot more insight and understanding of how the theorem is being used if you do it carefully. And after, so here's just some advice. So here's some useful advice. It is okay to be sloppy in mathematics only after you understand it and can provide the details. Once you can fill in all of the details yourself, then you can be sloppy. Then it's perfectly fine to be sloppy. And we're sloppy all the time in math in order to save time, in order to save space, and to communicate the most important ideas. But when you're learning it for your very, very first time, you do not want to do that. You want to try to write out the most important steps uh, in your derivation. You want to try to figure out how to do that carefully. You want to be able to set up the, um, the, the push-out diagram and then calculate it out. 